Hi everyone, and welcome to the Social Distancing GDC Edition presentation. Today, we're going to talk about adaptive placement of probes for global illumination and how we can use procedural techniques to take full advantage of your CPU power during this process. I'm your host, Diego Garzon, a procedural technical lead at Turnton Studios. Turn 10 is part of the first party studios at Microsoft Xbox that develops the Forza Motorsports franchise. After we ship Forza Motorsports 7, our team continued to look at ways in which we could create more dynamic conditions on track. As we explored Dynamic GI, we really liked the look we could get. During this talk, we want to showcase and examine Turn 10's approach to procedurally placing dynamic light probes. We explore the technical solutions and what can be improved in future implementations. We aim to share our approaches to some of these challenges with the hope that other studios and industry professionals can improve their workflows. I promise there will only be one equation. As a quick refresher, current techniques to achieve real-time global illumination involve placing light probes. A light probe is essentially a point in space with a six camera setup. These light probes are placed all over the environment. Radiance data is then baked into a texture from each light probe, which generates a 3D texture data grid. This data grid is then used at runtime to produce a dynamic global illumination effect. With that in mind, let's look at the challenges we face. Probes need to be strategically placed. You can't just place these probes everywhere. A rule set is needed to avoid interpenetration and probe proximity to geometry, which can cause visibility issues, light leaking, and scene problems. We also face an increasing complexity of building AAA environments. Manual probe placing will require an immense amount of effort on some poor soul. It's just not sustainable. We want to allow artists to be artists. Furthermore, the photorealistic visuals of our game and running at 60 frames per second at neighbor resolution leave little room for extra resources in terms of memory and disk space. We also needed to stay flexible for art direction and scalable. We have over 30 tracks in our game. Due to all the constraints we just mentioned, we knew that just placing props everywhere in the track was not going to work. A one-size-fits-all solution will not give the results and flexibility needed. So, where do we go from here? Well, let's try to only focus our limited resources on the most important part of our game. But what is that in a racing game? Well, the short answer is the area in the center. This area tends to be where most of the player's eye focus is at any given time to the viewer. Areas outside of this became less critical. This breakdown of the frame is done using leading lines to establish where our drivers look the most. The reason is focused on the immediate area of the car and down the road is because drivers tend to keep their eyes on the next turn, which informs where we focus on filling in the detail of the frame with light probes and art direction. This topic is exploring depth on another talk presented by the one and only Turn 10 CG Supervisor, Matt Collins. The talk is titled Art Directing for 100 miles per hour, and it goes into great depth over challenges of creating a compelling visual frame with very small margins for rendering. I really encourage everyone to go check it out. So now that we've identified that our focus will be on the drivable surface, how do we approach the problem? We start with the terrain and the road surface. We will call this our global course envelope, which will 
include the terrain and the road. We'll now do a step-by-step -step breakdown of this process. We start by loading the full track in Houdini. We create a square domain to create our tiles. This is important to get a nice axis aligned probe distribution. Once the tiles are generated, we need to recognize tiles that are valid and part of our track. We trace to our terrain geometry to identify only valid tiles. We don't want to spend any extra compute powers on tiles that will not be needed for any particular track. Since this is an adaptive approach, resolution, aka number of tiles, is important as it will give you a smoother transition between probe resolution levels. We then trace each tile midpoint to the closest edge on the road surface. We do this in VEX. We calculate the magnitude of this trace and record the result. This gives us a distance attribute for tile. We then normalize this distance using the max of our previously calculated attribute and remap this normalized distance to user-defined probes per meter distributions. In this example, I'm using 4, 8, 12, 32, and 128. This means on a tile with an 8, a probe will be generated every 8 meters. On a tile with a 32, a probe will be generated every 32 meters, so you get the idea. We then generate the live probes based on the tile probe per meter distribution attribute. The result is then retraced to the original terrain to ignore the road. This gives us a raw world layer. The process is then repeated only to the road. We use a 4 meter per pro distribution across the entire road. This is where we will focus most of our available resources. We then match our terrain and road generated light probes. This gives us our world envelope. But what about intersections? Well, for intersections, we load every other asset except the road and terrain. We create a sparse VDB volume representation of the intersection geometry. This is a very memory and computing intense operation, but it gives us watertight geometry that then we can use to specify what in and out means. We remove intersections using our VDB volume. This operation is applied to the full global envelope. What about the rest of the track? We will call this our local find envelope. And it includes all the other assets that are deemed important for the track that are not the road or the terrain. We use VDBs to group objects together that are made of many pieces. This helps get watertight geometry. It defines bounding box per pieces that we can process independently later on. We implemented a solver in Houdini that acts as a voxelizer. This is a two-step solve. This generates a high detail BDB per object that we use for processing each asset separately. It then generates a sparse voxel grid across the bounding box. Without voxels deactivated across the bounding box of the object. We create a dual envelope solver. We use the first envelope to capture probes generated within the one meter threshold to prune. Closer than this, it starts creating problems. We use the second envelope to activate the voxels we want, capturing only probes within a certain user-defined threshold to keep. We generate probes only on active voxels. The probes do not interpenetrate, and it also works well for internal probes. This generates a point cloud per object that guarantees probes will not be closer than one meter. Closer than this, it starts creating problems. And this works well with innocent probes as it will have no interpenetration. Let's see how all this comes together. We combine the envelopes, our global coarse envelope and our local finite envelope. And this is the final result for an entire track. 
We then export and bake out the data. We wrote an XML exporter in Python that will take care of this and it will translate data coming from Houdini into our game engine editor fuel, which then will give it to our force attack engine for processing. Baking time wasn't all that terrible. We found that number of probes has a direct impact on baking times. 3,500 probes took about two minutes, 10,000 probes took about five minutes, and a full track, which ranges between 90,000 and 150,000 probes, can take around an hour on a high-end Xbox. 125,000 probes is roughly equal to 88 megabytes in compressed disk space. So now let's take a look about the result implementations and the result of the process that we just walked through. This is the result of the global envelope with no global illumination on. This is with global illumination turned on. These are the generated probes from our point cloud layer approach that we just did. And this is the result of the global envelope with just the GI. Here's another example of the results in a local envelope object, which is this bridge. This is with no global illumination on. This is with global illumination on. These are the generated probes that are building the underlying data structure. And this is the GA path. Here we have another example of a local envelope object that has an indoor and outdoor component. This is with uh, no global illumination on. This is with global illumination on. These are doing the line light probes. And this is the GI that's being generated from that underlying data structure. So what exactly did we just do? Well, remember that we started the entire talk by saying that a probe is just a point in space. Well, in essence, light probes are just points, just point clouds. We can borrow techniques from our VFX and compositor friends from the industry to do what we call a layer point cloud approach. What this means is that since we cannot generate heuristics that will solve for every scenario, we split the problem into two logical steps that we can manage and later on merge. In this case, it was the global course envelope, the terrain point cloud minus the wrong point cloud, an intersection geometry, and the local final envelope, which was just everything else that was local generated and important to the game, hero buildings, barriers, trucks, race days, etc. These two steps together gives us our layer equation. And as I promised at the beginning of this presentation, there's only one equation that will be, and this is it. The entire equation of what we did is the rain point cloud plus the wrong point cloud minus the intersection geometry plus the local generating point cloud. That is, in a nutshell, what the process was to generate this data. So now that we got this equation out of the way, how do we scale? The processing of many objects can take a significant amount of time. Given the resolution of our first volume to get an accurate representation of the geometry, baking at an artist's desk is not ideal. So we decided to use a procedural dependency graph. But what exactly is this? A procedural dependency graph, or PDG, it's a procedural architecture designed to distribute tasks and manage dependencies to better scale, automate, and analyze content pipelines for film, TV, games, advertisement, and VR. This technology had its humble beginnings in Microsoft. We used to call it a spaghetti, as you can see on the left, because it was clearly a joy to use. You really felt compelled to just 
come and make the best work with it. Luckily, this has made it outside of the gates of Microsoft and SideFX has made an improved and more user-friendly implementation. Because it is a process-intensive solution, we translate the setup using a dependency graph. We use Houdini PDG to accomplish this. We then offload the process into the farm. And in the farm, it starts dividing all these dependencies per core that we have defined for this setup. As you can see, the setup is not terribly complex. And it really allowed us to iterate faster on these tracks. Let's recap what we've done so far. We had a need to place live probes with a set of guidelines. Since we couldn't generate heuristics that will solve for every scenario, we used the point cloud layer approach. This means we broke the problem into more digestible parts. Our local fine envelope and our world core envelope. This allowed for flexibility to tackle each of the particular guidelines for each scenario. We then took this setup and PDG5 it per se to make our voxelization solve on the farm. We found this thing need to be valid for indoor and outdoor lighting conditions. We also found the probe resolution matters a lot. There's a sweet spot between probes, memory, and disk space. For this particular scenario, a racing game, an adaptive solution works well. While this technique gives the optimal adaptive probe distribution, the underlying data is still low risk at a 32 by 32 texture across the world. What we hope to do moving forward is while the adaptive placing probes where the detail is needed gives good results, this is limited by doing their line structure using a 32 by 32 texture. We hope to take the same approach to define that underlying data structure. This will give the most optimal probe distribution and texture resolution. And with this, we have come to the end of the social distancing GDC edition presentation. I want to give special thanks to the great team at Turn 10, everyone in Microsoft, to X-Ray Halperin, whose work on procedural lighting tools was an inspiration for a lot of these solutions, to Gil Rosado and Chris Crosetto for being in charge of the tools and doing an amazing job, Andrew Berkin, the lighting lead, and everyone in the procedural department. Lastly, I want to thank all the amazing game developer community as we build on each other's ideas. And last but not least, I want to invite everyone to uh, please contact me with uh, any questions that you might have regarding the material that was just presented, I'll be happy to get back to you in a timely manner. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Stay safe. Cheers.